A quick word on Dr. Don Paris. He'll be with us for 45 minutes here. He's an author, a mu musician, and a spiritual scientist. He's not a person that's new to us. He's been there for GCSS with us. So we know him, and he has been working in the field of radionics and spiritual science for the past 30 years, training people in over 35 countries around the world in this field. As soon as my presentation comes up here, I will um, start a journey because what this is all about is not a study or, or an experience as much as it is a journey. What we're talking about with quantum is something that is part of everyday existence. We are living in a quantum reality. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be in a quantum reality? So what I would like to do this afternoon is show you how we're living in a quantum reality and what you can do to expand your awareness of that and then use that to not only your advantage but also to everyone's advantage. Can I get my first slide, please? He's working on it. So I'll go ahead and start talking about this and the slides will come up. Um, there are several different interpretations. Now, I know a lot of you are new to this concept of what quantum reality is. This idea of quantum has only come up into the general public in the last 20 years. Even though the science is, is older than that, the, the awareness into the public has lagged behind. But there are different interpretations about what, what quantum is, and I'd like to share with you what that is so that you can understand a little bit more what is quantum? Why does everybody talk about quantum? Did you know that there's more than one universe? How many people think there's one universe? That's why they call it the universe, right? Universe, one verse. Well, in quantum, we think that there's an infinite number of universes, at least according to the parallel universe's interpretation of what quantum physics is. So this was discovered or developed this concept by uh, John Wheeler and his student, um, oh, what's his name? All oh, those names, you know. Um, Everett. Yes, Everett. Um, they developed this concept that we don't live in one universe, we live in a multiverse, as many universes as you could possibly imagine, but only one slice of that is the one that you're perceiving and is manifest at this moment. But that doesn't mean the others don't have valid existence. We have a range of universes that we exist in. So do we all live in the same universe? I have to say at this point in my experience, the answer is no. I'm living in my universe, you're living in your universe, and our universes are co-resonating so that we can experience each other's universe, but we're not in the same universe. Yeah? Does that make sense? Each one of us is developing and holding with our own energy field our own universe. And then we co-resonate with others that are in similar vibrational rates. So according to the, the parallel universe's concept, we can make a quantum leap from one universe to another universe. And that's where the magic comes in. That's what's so exciting about this. The new concept of quantum is that we're not stuck in our universe or an, in an universe, in one single universe. We can start to expand our consciousness and perceive a different universe, the one that we want to perhaps be in, and we can jump from one universe to another universe. And this has happened to me many times. The SE5-1000 is technology. It's a radionics technology that will help individuals to change their reality. Now, when we talk about quantum, we talk about healing. Realistically, the best healing is when you move from one universe where, let's say, there's a disease or, or a sickness into another universe where that is not happening, where there's health, vitality, and wholeness. And so that's what we do with the SE5. One of the techniques that we use is to go back in time 
right? Time is also a dimension, like space. We go back in time to the point when the disease first began, that inception point. And that inception point is much easier to clear the energy around that inception point than it is 20 years later when the disease is full blown. So we use this type of technology, the scalar technology, to go back in time and find that exact moment when the disease started and then we clear the energy and the information at that point and then it just naturally rolls forward on the timeline and uh, creates a different reality. It moves the consciousness, the, the awareness and the person into a new reality space. This is an experiment we did with some seeds. These seeds uh, were just planted in the same row box, but were, they were not given any new information at all. So the seeds down below, we used the SE5 and we imprinted information. Now there's no energy, it's just information. And we told these seeds that they had more nutrition, they had more sunlight, they had more energy to grow, life force energy. And you can see for yourself, these grew in the same amount of time as these did on the top. They, they grew without any extra external chemicals or fertilizers or anything different in the physical world. But in the other dimensional world, we fed them new information. And in my workshop, I will go through on Monday how information is the primary force that comes before energy, before manifestation, and before uh, physical reality. Oh, let me go back one. This is another experiment. Now in this experiment what we did was we took some holograms and I'm going to ex explain a little bit about holograms and what they are and, and what you can do with them and where that idea came from. We imprinted these holograms with some informational fields to keep the fruit fresh. Now can you see the difference between the fruit that has the holograms and the fruit that didn't have the hologram? They both sat for the same amount of time, I think it was 10 or 12 days, and the ones that have the holograms on them to keep their energy field intact and the life force intact are still fresh. And the one that didn't is completely uh, starting to shrivel up and turn colors. Just some ideas, experiments. Now this one is an experiment. Can you uh, click the mouse for me on there? That'll start the film. We did an experiment with some water. And what we did was we energized the water first, and then we put cut flowers into uh, two vases. Now, one was not energized. So you'll see we have normal tap water on the left-hand side. And then it's time-lapse photography. Now it's 48 hours, 60 hours, 72 hours. It's holding up pretty well the same. In the charged water side, you'll see on the right-hand side, the flowers, after about 144 hours, are still strong, and the, the tap water flowers are starting to wilt down. Oh, finally we lost one here on the right, but the rest of them are holding up. And 228 hours, 240 hours, you can see the difference. Now, this is the type of science that we need to show that this kind of other dimensional type work. Now there was nothing in the water other than new information. We just imprinted the water with vitality. What is vitality? Life force. There's energy. So we're going to get see a top view here in a second. You can see what happened after 11 days. These flowers on the left were completely still open and bright and, and excited about life. The other one's nor using normal tap water. Now it was the same tap water to begin with. We just energized it with some, some information. And it lasted about 25% longer. So these are just some ideas. Now, that's just to get your attention. So I, do I have your attention so far? OK. <laughs> now I want to explain the difference between Newtonian physics. And this is not going to be difficult. I'll make it fun. Newtonian physics quantum physics, string theory, and informational fields. These, this is the progression of where physics has come. Now, Newtonian physics is called that because of Isaac Newton. And he discovered 
most of the fundamental laws of gravity, you know, like uh, every force in one direction has an equal and opposite force in the other direction. And much of science, a huge portion of science and, until the last 25 years or so, is all based on Isaac Newton. His concept was that the world, the universe, was basically a clock. It was a machine. And this machine ran forward in time. And no matter what you did, you don't stop the clock. It's a mechanical universe. So if you want to make a change, you make an external change. Yeah? Does that make sense? You make an external change in order to make a change in the external universe. That's how we got ourselves into the mess that we're in right now. But it also got us into the level of technology that we also are in at the, at the present time. So like, for example, with gravity, he came up with the concepts of, of uh, how gravity moves and, and spatial relationships. There was a lot of things that he did well, and um, it was the beginning of our technological age, basically. And that made the sciences that we have today. For example, his concept was we look out into space and we see the planets. The big things and the small things were basically mirrors of one another. And he created laws for these things. So the stars were basically like um, uh, the atoms and the atoms were like the stars. And the left brain knowledge, all these mathematical formulas, they all basically came from Newton's formulas. I mean, a lot of people helped create all of this, but it, the original point was from Newton. When they got down to the atom, they had some problems because the original concept was, like I said, uh, they thought that the atom was like our solar system because we looked out at our solar system, we saw the sun in the middle, the planets going around, and so they expected the atoms to look kind of the same because they kind of had the same properties, like so, like the big things and the small things. The problem they ran into is that the mathematics didn't work. And <clears throat> that was basically the beginning point of quantum mechanics. The idea of quantum mechanics was to try to quantify very, very, very small things, like subatomic particles and atoms. And they didn't behave the same way as planets did. Like, for example, when we take a telescope and we, we dial in, now of course we use computers, you know, we can use coordinates, and we put in the coordinates and we say, okay, Saturn is going to be right here at this time tonight. And they punch it in and sure enough, you look in the telescope and you see Saturn 100% of the time. It just works. And that's Newtonian physics. With quantum physics, they said, okay, it should work just like that when, with the telescope. So we'll look at the atom, and we want to look at the electron, and we should probably be able to figure out, let's see, if it's going around in this direction, at this time it should be right there. The problem is it didn't work. It wouldn't show up. Sometimes it would, but sometimes it wouldn't. So they had to develop a mathematics and a concept, a totally different concept, about how to determine where this electron would show up. And that was the law of probabilities. They could determine probably, most probably, where these uh, electrons would show up, but they couldn't say for certain. And that's where we got into this mm, no man's land, somewhere between, between Newtonian physics that was completely predictable and these quantum ideas of probabilities. Now Einstein came up, you know, this was during the time of Einstein, and he said, look, God doesn't play dice with the universe. This can't be true. So he got together with two other physicists, Podolsky and Rosin, and they decided they were going to prove that quantum physics, once and for all, didn't exist and it doesn't work. So they did what's called the EPR experiment. It was a thought experiment between three people, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosin. And they ended up proving that it worked. He came to the conclusion that God must be playing dice with the universe. So this was proven later. Oh, this is an example. So this is now the new concept 
of quantum physics. The proton is in the middle, and the electron is more like in a cloud state. It isn't like a planet going around the sun. It's more like in this infinite field of po possibilities. And most probably, it will be in a specific place at a specific time. And then this cloud, they call it the collapse of the wave function. Now, this is just one interpretation of quantum physics. The Copenhagen interpretation says that all at once, these infinite probabilities will collapse into this precise moment, and the electron will manifest and become physical now. The interesting thing that happened with that is that they found the electron wherever they looked 100% of the time. So how could, how could it always collapse where they were looking for it? That doesn't make sense. So if they did their calculations and they, they had like seven probabilities, but they're going to look for it over here, and it showed up there 100% of the time, or maybe they chose a different prob probability and it showed up there 100% of the time, what is the determining factor? Consciousness, the observer. Correct. The observer is what was causing the collapse of the wave function into the particle. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is it's multiple realities that we're living in an infinite number of parallel universes and we jump into the universe where the atom, where that electron is already showing up as a particle. That's where it is. And in the other universes, it is not. Yeah, and consciousness determines which universe we're going to jump into. This is another interpretation. Which one I prefer, actually, because I like multiple choices and, and I like multiple realities that I can jump into. So later, after the EPR experiment with Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, John Bell came up with a way to prove that this was true in the physical world. And so he came up with what's called Bell's theorem. And he came up with this idea, okay, if we take an electron, a coupled, I mean a photon, if we take a, a coupled photon and we split it in half and we send it in two directions, we can only measure one side at a time. We can only observe one side at a time, right? We can't look in two directions at the same time. But his theorem was, if this is true, what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen said, now, a, let me step back one step. A photon has an interesting property. It can either behave as a wave, like, for example, if you think about a wave and there's a piece of wood in the ocean and a wave come by, comes by, the wood doesn't move very much. It just sort of goes up and down with the wave. So a photon can behave as a wave or it can behave as a particle. And a particle would be like another piece of wood on the same ocean, and it bumps that piece of wood and pushes it forward. So we've either got the billiard ball idea or we've got the wave idea. And his idea was that if we split a photon and we send it in two directions, if quantum mechanics is true, if we measure the photon to be a wave, it can be measured either way, but you can only measure it one way or the other way. If we measure this photon to become a to be a particle, this one will also be a particle. And if we measure this one to be a wave, this one will also be a wave. Now this is, holds true, now they're thinking in big terms here. So let's say, for example, a photon starts at the sun and it's coming toward Earth, but there's, there's a planet in between and it has to split into two, por two portions, let's say. And it goes around this planet and we measure it on this side of the planet and on the other side of the planet, it behaves exactly the same way. So if we measure it as a particle on one side, it also will behave as a particle on the other side of the planet. And it happened. It happens 100% of the time. This is an actual reality. And here's just a little diagram that shows you how they did it. They split the photon with a prism and they have little electronic observers, not physical observers, but they have electronic observers. And it gets even weirder than this. They, they ended up finding out that these, these photons almost have a personality. And so one time they split it and they thought, okay, we'll have little sensors 
all the way up, but we won't actually observe it 100% until it gets to this end. And so they were able to go back in time with this, this other sensor to see what happened. The photons split, they went apart, and they're going up here, and up until this point, they were behaving as a wave. And then they changed their mind real quickly at this end, and they said, no, let's measure it as a particle. And this photon went back in time and retraced its steps and became a particle. But up, up until that point, it had behaved as a wave. They did this in Maryland, and it's strange. So photons are like, are like alive. That's an odd concept, isn't it? That wouldn't go well in the Newtonian physics because he thought everything was a machine. But now we understand that light and photons and even human beings are alive. We have consciousness in us. This was another experiment talking about um, another concept of Einstein's was that he observed this aspect of quantum physics that there's this spooky action at a distance. In other words, so if this photon on this side of the planet was measured as a particle, and on the other side of the planet it also became a particle, there must be faster than light transfer of information between those two photons. They've got to be talking. Of course, he thought that was impossible. That's why he went about trying to disprove uh, quantum mechanics. But not too long ago, they actually proved that there is this spooky action at a distance, scientifically proven. Now, of course, we've been doing this for 100 years with radionics, but we're kind of outside the normal science. They don't really recognize uh, radionics as being a science. But here's an article about, about um, proving that this action at a distance can happen and does happen. Now, David Bohm was a, was a quantum physicist, and he is famous for coming up with the concept that we live in a holographic universe. And I'm going to explain what a hologram in is, is and what that means in terms of being in a holographic universe. But he also uh, spent a lot of time with Krishnamurti. So he understood, once he got this concept that we're living in this hologram, this, this holographic universe, that that was very much related to what the spiritual concepts were for thousands of years. And so he had a lot of conversations with Krishnamurti and they blended their ideas together and um, launched a whole new awareness level of quantum physics and spirituality. And this was kind of the, the marriage between quantum physics and spirituality was with David Bohm. So let's talk about what a hologram is. So if we take a normal photograph of an apple, for example, it's just a normal photograph, two-dimensional, two not a holograph, three-dimensional picture, just a normal photograph, and we were to cut that photograph in four pieces, we end up with four different parts of the apple, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? We get one slice of that if we take out just one of those. Well, a hologram works a little differently. The holographic camera uses prisms and bends the light around and, and it creates not a photograph to begin with. We use lasers and, and we bounce photons off of different sides of the apple in this case. But what comes out on the holographic film is not a picture of an apple. It looks like a bunch of squiggles like this. When you shine a laser light back through that film plate, you get this three-dimensional looking image of an apple. It's very magical looking. So what happens if you were to cut the holographic film into four pieces and you were to shine a laser light through just one quarter of that film? Do we get to see a quarter of the apple like we did when we cut a 2D uh, film piece into, into four pieces? No. When we put the laser light through it, we actually get the entire picture of the apple. It's just not quite as clear. <laughs> so this is the exciting part. So if we were to shine a laser light through all four pieces of that holographic film that we've cut into four pieces now, 
What do you think we get? We get four apples. Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. Let's imagine for a minute that you're God, okay? But you're not a two-dimensional God. You're a three-dimensional God, yeah? You're all-powerful, and you're three dimensions, and you decided, you know what would be really fun? I could split myself up into a trillion, trillion, trillion pieces, and then we'll shine a little laser light through each one of those, and guess what? I'll become everything in the universe. And that's what's sitting in this room right now. We are light shines through it. So each one of us is like a little piece of that shattered mirror that, that is having this cosmic light shine through it. And we're manifest here as three-dimensional beings. But realistically, we're all the same. We're all the one holographic film that's been shattered into a million pieces, and we're all exactly the same. We're all God. That's what we are. Let that sink in for a minute. Each one of us, right here, right now, we are God manifest. Now, the exciting part is, guess what you can do with your little piece of shattered mirror? You can connect with other mirrors and you can combine your consciousness together through meditation, through contemplation, through focusing your mind and your energy back to the source, and guess what happens? Your mirror gets bigger, and you can reflect more of the cosmic energy through your holographic film, and you become more of God. Now, I don't think we're ever going to become the complete all that is. But I'm sure going to try. You want to join me? Let's all become as much of God as we can. So the next theory that came after quantum theory is called string theory. And this happened in about, must have been about 1986, I think, um, when some quantum physicists got together and started discussing the nature of things and they looked down further than some atomic particles and they said, you know what, I think realistically what's happening is the fundamental particle, because you know they've been looking for this fundamental particle forever, they just built this huge thing in Switzerland to smash atoms together and look for the smallest particle possible and no matter how far they go they find smaller and smaller particles. But with string theory, they said, no, 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 no. There are no particles. You know what they really are? They're little strings, but they're, they're calling them strings, but they're actually vibrations. And these two vibrations, when two of these vibrations intersect, it creates a particle, an energetic particle. And that's the basis of string theory. And that's the newest, latest um, physics that is, is being looked at as a serious uh, uh, contender for, for a unified field theory. Doesn't that sound a lot like what Krishnamurti was talking about? I mean, some of you are familiar with, we'll just say all the saints. All of the gurus and the saints have said that the world is made up of vibrations, and vibrations are primary, and the matter is secondary. So now we're really starting to bridge the gap between physics and spirituality to make an understanding. So if you really want to understand physics, meditate more. <laughs> Listen to what Sri Patri says, meditate. You will understand quantum physics. That's what I did. I'm not a quantum physicist. I don't know anything about any of this. I just sit and meditate and it all comes in and makes sense. So that's where I got my theories. Okay, the next step is what's beyond string theory? And that is my theory, which is informational fields are pre-vibration. In other words, information, pure information, pure conscious awareness, pure informational fields are, are primary before even vibrational strings come together and create subatomic particles. And I described that in my book. It's called Regaining Wholeness Through the Subtle Dimensions. And I was, I was awarded an honorary PhD 
for my work with this, um, with this concept and these theories. Thank you. <laughs> So we call these informational fields intrinsic data fields. They're intrinsic because they're primary. The, they're the original data fields. These are the blueprints for reality. And in my workshop on Monday, I will show you exactly step by step how that works and what we can do with them. I don't have time to go into all of it uh, today, but on Monday, and my workshop will be in the morning in Hall 1. Uh, we start at 10 o'clock, and um, I hope a lot of you will, will come for that. But in the meantime, if you don't make it for that, you can get my book uh, free online. You just go to my website, um, se-5.com. Make sure you put the dash in there. And you'll see here on the, um, on the left-hand side, you'll see you can put in your name and your email address, and you'll receive not only my book, but you'll receive a series of, of newsletters that I have written that explain what scalar theory is, a little bit about informational theories, and what you can do with that, uh, that knowledge yourself. Uh, the picture of me down at the bottom was the last time I was here speaking at the uh, Global uh, Spiritual Sciences Congress. And so I also have that video on my website. If you haven't seen that lecture, um, it's a little bit longer and you'll get a little, lot different information actually. It's a totally different talk. So what all of this brings together and the next step for, for humanity, really as a whole, is to move from this concept that we use computers, we use an automobile, we use things external to ourselves that are machines. And the next step is to find out that we can use this process of consciousness and interact with technology. Now, we have to design technology to do that, which is happening as we speak, there is older experimental research that has been done in this area in the, in the terms of called radionics, which we didn't know that it was consciousness interactive technology when it first started a hundred years ago, but it has evolved over time to where it is today. And uh, this consciousness interactive technology relies on our ability to access, uh, that's not quite the way I want to say it. Since it's interactive, the technology will not work like a machine. In other words, it's not a push button. You don't go and, uh, you know, like a washing machine, you throw your clothes in, you set the timer, put the soap in, and you walk away. Even though it behaves like that, it's accessing another dimension which is relying on your consciousness. And I'm not talking about your conscious mind. It's your consciousness itself. You're interacting at another dimensional level with this technology. And that's what produces the magic. I don't know if you noticed the subtitle of my book, where it's, but it's called Where Science Meets Magic. And that's what we're working with. We're working with technology that appears many times to be magical. And many times it doesn't. It's, it has to do with probabilities and possibilities. Again, going back to quantum physics, I know everybody says anything is possible. I don't really believe that. I think that anything that is possible does exist, but it's not probable. For example, a spaceship could just appear and manifest itself on top of the, the King's Chamber meditation spot in the next five minutes. It is possible. It's one of the millions, zillion possibilities in the universe, but it's not probable. Yeah. Nothing's impossible, but it's not necessarily probable. So what we do with this technology, from my observation over the last 30 years, is that we can move possibilities toward the probability stage. And this is the fun part and looks like magic. We can move a probability into actuality. That's what and that's when it appears like magic, because it's probable, it's probably going to happen, but we just give it that extra nudge, and then it brings it into manifestation, and everybody goes, wow, how did that happen? I want you to do that with the spaceship now. It's like, well, that's a possibility. That's way over there, you know? So you have to kind of discern where your boundary conditions are. In quantum physics, we have what are called boundary conditions. If something's outside of the boundary conditions, you might be able to move them inside the boundary conditions, 
but if they're inside the boundary conditions, you can usually move them into actuality. Yeah? It's important to remember, especially when these things look so miraculous, because they really do. <laughs> Sometimes it just looks like this is out, outrageous. So this is the SE5-1000, and um, how magical is this? <laughs> okay, let me give you an idea. We take a photograph of a piece of land, okay, it's just a photo. We put the photo inside of the instrument, and we can read, now let's say I took a photo of some land in India, and I'm sitting in America or in Bali. I can in real time read out all the nutritional values of the, solo, of the soil. I can find out if the plants are healthy or if they're not well. There's a lot of things I can do from a photograph. I can put a photograph inside there and read out everything in real time. Now what happens if I put in a, a photo of a person? I can do the same thing, real time information. How accurate is it? Galen Hieronymus, who is um, a good friend of my mentor, Dr. Willard Frank, who I trained with for, for 25 years, he did a study uh, with the Apollo 11 mission. And he got a photograph of one of the astronauts, and he measured his uh, vital signs from a photograph every hour, like his breathing rate and his heart rate and things like that. The same things that they're doing on the spacecraft, you know, they're, they're wired up and they, they monitor their health up there. So he did this every hour from here to the moon on one astronaut. He created a 500 page report. Yeah, that was a lot of diligence, I must say. Um, more diligence than I have. But he did this for the entire trip and he took the 500 page report and he sent it to NASA. And he said, could you compare this to what you, what you guys were reading on the spacecraft? It matched hour by hour from here all the way to the moon. Hour by hour. I probably shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to anyway. So I have a friend who's an SE5 practitioner, and he had a friend that was an astronaut. And this was many years later. And uh, so he was talking with him about radionics and this kind of thing, and, and that we use a photograph. And he said, you know, that reminds me. When I was in my training, they took me into this special room and they put me on this platform and it turned really slowly and I had to take off all my clothes and they took this three-dimensional holographic picture of me. And I said, on the way out, well, what's that for? And he said, well, in case you get sick while you're out in space, we can fix you from here. <laughs> so they, they, that report must have had an impact in NASA. Later he denied the whole story to my friend because I said, I wanted to get more information about this. So he calls him again. He said. I never told you that story. No, no, that never happened. But it did happen, and uh, it's part of their, you know, not talked about stuff in NASA. So on Monday, I will actually do a physical demonstration with this. We'll take a couple volunteers. We'll go through things, and, and I'll show you what we can do. But, um, and I'll also talk about scalar fields and pure, inf pure informational fields and collapsed electromagnetic fields, how we create all of this. It's, it's a fascinating study. This is fantastic stuff. This was a question that I had when I was pre preparing for this talk. Should we call it information medicine? Now that we've got quantum, medi uh, quantum medicine, should we call this new, new um, field of study informational medicine? Some people are calling it that. But my question with it is, what would it be? So some of the ideas that I came up with was, there already is information medicine. Homeopathy is information medicine. They've taken information, they've put it into a pill or water, and they dilute it so many times there is no chemical substance left in there. There's nothing left in there other than the uh, sugar tablet or the water. So all that's left is, is information. The next one is positive support. That actually is medicine. This can be extreme. For example, there's a very famous uh, event that happened a woman went to a doctor and he said, boy, you know, she was really sick. And they said, okay, we better do exploratory surgery. So she said, okay, she agreed to it. They took her in the operating room. He opened her up and she had so much cancer inside of her. He said, there's nothing we can do. 
and so they sewed her back up and um, took her out but the doctor said you know I didn't have the heart to tell her so he said came out to her and he said well it's okay he, sh he thought she would probably live about two to three weeks everything went fine we looked through everything there wasn't anything there you know go home have a good life you know he just didn't have the heart to tell her so she went home and she came back a few months later and uh, she was completely healthy and she lived the rest of her life without any problems this was pure information from one doctor she believed him and he said it in all good faith not to harm her but and and he didn't even know it would have that effect but um, but he gave her information only information and her whole entire body healed completely healed so that's positive support or talking another one would be prayer or meditation we've all heard of distant healing through meditation or prayer somebody had mentioned it uh, earlier Dr. Uh, Goswami mentioned that that there are places um, that are doing distant healing through prayer and meditation this is another form of information traveling at a distance and then of course we have program substances like holograms crystals tachyon energy this has become a whole field a huge field I mean we're talking 20 to 30 million dollars a year just for one product people are programming using our technology the SE5 to program crystals or holograms and then they like for example on Amazon they have uh, you can buy them now hologram stickers for pain and you just stick it on wherever it hurts and the pain goes away yeah it's cool stuff we'll go through more of that uh, on Monday so a couple months ago I went to China and um, this man Dr. Han um, has been collecting ancient herbal remedies ancient Chinese remedies that uh, most of them do not exist anymore because either the family member that knew how to make them has passed on and, and it didn't get passed on to the children but the remedies still exist so he's been collecting these for years he spent over eight hundred thousand dollars collecting these ancient herbal remedies his concern was that they don't know how to make them and he found out about the SE5 and so um, I went to China and what he wanted me to do was to measure each one of these herbal remedies and convert that into digital information that we can store in the computer and then we can take and reconvert that digital information back into usable energy or information again not energy and imprint it into water or crystal or holograms and see if that would have the same effect on the clients as the original remedy so we ended up doing over 500 remedies I sat there for four or five days six seven hours a day measuring each one of these remedies we were very committed we have we had a team of about 20 people boiling up the remedies and then passing them on and we did step by step and we created a frequency informational frequency tuning for each one of those 500 remedies and they've tried them on over 200 people by now this was a few months ago and it's worked about 80 percent of the remedies that we're putting into water are working just the same as the original remedy yeah this is really exciting research now I'm, I'm not saying it works 80 percent of the time it doesn't work for every remedy it doesn't mean you could take uh, let's say a, a drug a specific drug and then get a frequency for it and then get put that into water and it would work just like the drug some it does but not all of them but with the herbal remedies their frequency range is in a good frequency range and we're we've had about 80 percent success with them so it's just me working on the on those but they were also working in agriculture they've been doing this for about three years and um, in China they wanted to have their own name so they call it the quantum space equalizer not the SE5 they they couldn't relate to those letters SE5 it didn't make sense so they came up with their own name and it's called the the quantum space equalizer and they use the QSE to take this piece of land and this is what the soil looked like it looks a lot like the soil here it was not uh, very good soil to begin with and over a three-year period um, they turned it in, into um, this gardens and edible plants and it's, they did a lot of experiments along the way for example uh, it's jumping um, <clears throat> can you guys see the the yellow lines here this was the only area they wanted to see what would happen if they only 
sent the informational fields to that specific area. And this is the area that they, they treated right here. And in the next one, they did it in the circular area. And you can see that the plants were responding much better in that area than the rest of the field. And that gave them a lot of hope. And um, they're expanding their, their fields. They did a lot of also row studies. So they, they labeled the rows and then uh, looked at which rows they were, they were treating and which ones they weren't. And we'll go more into this kind of thing uh, in the workshop as well. They did all these studies back in the 1950s. This is not new. But because of the chemical companies, they've suppressed most of this information. But they get a lot of food, and it's beautiful, and they're very excited about all that in China. So this is an example. I'm sure you've all seen these, the work of Dr. Emoto. Um, and he wrote in Japanese the word dirty on a vial of water here down at the bottom. And that uh, is what then he froze the water afterwards after he had written it on the, on the vial and set it down. And he took the same water in a different vial and he wrote the word beautiful on it. And he froze both of them and then looked at them under the microscope. This information was imprinted into the water. Yeah? So which one would you rather drink? That one? Now there's only information in there. Or the beautiful one? I vote for the beautiful one. So when you have your glass of water, if you want to make it better, just write on, on a piece of paper or some tape or something and say beautiful, lovely, loving, high vibrations, God, and tape it onto your glass of water. It will charge the water with higher frequency energy. This was some uh, Tokyo tap water before praying. And he uh, put a vial on a, on a desk and then he sent out information to 500 people and said, everybody focus your, your attention and your prayers onto this water and think good thoughts about it. And this is what the water turned out after they prayed onto that water, 500 people. Now it doesn't take 500 people. <laughs> he did another experiment where he took a small radionics uh, instrument and he put a flower essence into one well and then transferred the information into the water. And this was um, with some little daisies and uh, chamomile. And interestingly enough, these are not flowers down here. This is the ice, these are the ice crystals. They did color in the center with some yellow to make it look uh, more similar. But it, it looked very similar to the, to the flower. And you know, there are flower essences like homeopathic remedies that are flower essences. And it takes the vibration or the information from that flower and, and stores it in the water. I have a whole lot more studies like this that they've done in Germany where you can see that the information is imprinted in the water and they've now determined that water has memory ability. It can actually memorize the information. This was done with fennel. And look how different it came out. It looks much more like the fennel than it did like the daisies. Just interesting, interesting experiments. So these are some studies. With, this was the original uh, SE5, the second version of it, um, that Dr. Willer Frank had developed. And these studies were all done in Germany. The row of seeds on the top were not given any information, and the seeds below were given the information of health and vitality and uh, stronger energy. And you can see, after 10 days, that they have been much more energized and have more vitality. These were the ones you saw before. This was an experiment uh, that I did actually myself because I saw their study and I thought, I want to try that. And this is what I came up with. This was my greenhouse. And of course, I had a good feeling about the seeds. So I, I actually put the information into almost all the seeds and just a few of them I didn't because I had a feeling they weren't going to grow very well. But the rest of them then I planted. And uh, these are all growing in just lava rock. And uh, they just grew wonderful salads and we ate them all. And, and it was wonderful. Now this was another experiment. We put uh, informational fields into water and we did a control study. So the water on the left had no informational fields in it. The water on the right, we looked at it under a microscope and it grew small little crystals in it. And I got this idea from uh, Galen Hieronymus. He had done a video like this where you could actually see the crystals growing right when they were uh, putting the informational fields in. So these crystalline structures hold the information. Just another Another slide. On the left are just uh, the control studies and on the right were these beautiful little crystals that grew in the water. 
So we think that the information is actually resonating from another dimension through a crystalline structure into the physical. We're creating matter from information. Yeah? And now you guys understand how this can happen. These were uh, some trees in Germany and they balanced them for over three years and they did it about 100 kilometers away and after three years they looked, whoops, they looked like this. And then they did another plot where these were the trees, uh, these were deciduous trees and after th they worked on them for over a period of three years and this is what they looked like after three years. And that was during a drought actually. That actually, um, in the middle, second year there was a drought and they still came back even stronger than before. I'm going to go a little bit quicker because uh, this was some apple juice and orange juice and they were attempting to not have any mold grow. So this was the informed juices, apple juice and orange juice, and these were the uninformed juices and they put them on a heater for two weeks and the ones on the right obviously grew a lot more mold. Um, this just shows the idea of the aura and the informational field. I'm going to slip through these. So what, what I want to do, uh, I'm just going to have to finish up, but I want to show you that tomorrow, or on Monday, I'll go through um, a chakra organ testing example. And the chakras have related organs to them. I know a lot of you already know this information, but we can actually test. Because what happens is the cosmic energy comes into the chakras, and if the chakra is shut down, it will starve the organs. The organs actually feed from the cosmic energy through the chakra. The other way around is also true. If the organs are traumatized, they'll try to pull too much energy through the chakra and it will shut down the chakra. And we can test that and find out, is it primarily a chakra problem or is it a, an organ problem? So we'll do that on Monday. And uh, these are just some of the charts. And um, we'll also go through a more... Um, medical, medical perspective, um, are we looking at relief from disease or are we going for optimum health? And so my concept is we want to move out of this concept of getting rid of symptoms, we want to move into optimizing our health and well-being and that's really the key. And with that I think I'll leave you and I hope to see you all of you on Monday, Monday morning in Hall 1. Thank you very much.